Hello, readers and listeners. Today we're reading Whatever After, Fairiest of All by Sarah Malonsky. Poor Baloo. This is not a joke. Once upon a time, my life was normal. Then the mirror in our basement ate us. Do you think I'm joking? Do you think I'm making this up? You do, don't you? You're thinking, um, Abby, mirrors don't usually go ahead and slurp people up. Mirrors just hang on the wall and reflect stuff. Well, you're wrong. So very wrong. Everything I'm going to tell you is the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I'm not making anything up and I'm not a liar. Or a crazy person who thinks she's telling the truth but secretly isn't. I'm in fact a very logical person. Fair too. I have to be since I'm going to be a judge when I grow up. Well, first I'm going to be a lawyer and then I'm going to be a judge because you have to be a lawyer first. That's the rule. But yeah, I'm an extremely logical, extremely particle, and extremely uncrazy 10-year-old girl whose life went completely berserk after her parents forced her to move to Smithville. Still don't believe me? You will when you hear all the facts. You will when you hear the whole story. Let me start at the beginning. Chapter 1, The Beginning. The moment the Reese's bell rings, the kids in my new fifth grade class decide they want to play tag. We eeny, meeny, miny, and somehow I'm it. Me, the new kid. Great. Not. I cover my eyes to give the other kids a 10 second head start. Okay, five. Then run toward the fence. Straight away, I spot Penny, who is very tall. Well, taller than me, although most people are taller than me. She's also wearing a bright orange sweatshirt that's hard to miss. I don't know all the kids' names, but Penny is easy to remember because she always wears super high ponytails. And I just think, Penny's pony, Penny's pony, Penny's pony. I dash over and tap her on the elbow. You're at Penny's pony, I mean Penny. She looks at me strangely. Um, no, I'm frozen. Huh? It's not that cold. Plus her orange sweater looks really warm. What? I ask. Penny wrinkles her forehead. You tagged me. I'm frozen. No, I say slowly. I was it. I tagged you. So now you're it. Now you have to tag someone else to make them be it. That's why the game is called it. I blink. I mean tag. The person has to tag everyone, Penny says. Her tone suggests she knows way more about tag than I do. And my cheeks heat up because she doesn't. When you're tagged, you freeze, and the la very last person tagged is the next it. It's called freeze tag. Got it? The last person to get tagged gets to be it. If you're the last person tagged, that means you're the best player. If you're the best player, you should get to do a happy dance while everyone throws confetti on you. You should not have to be the new it, because being it is not a reward. My heart sinks. If I have to be it until every last fifth grader is tagged or frozen, this is going to be a very, very, very long game. Here's the thing. I'm trying to have a fresh start and be flexible about my new school, but how can I when the people here do everything wrong? Please allow me to present my case. One, everyone in Smithville calls Coke, Pepsi, and Orange Crush soda. Ridiculous, right? Pop is a much better name. Pop, pop, pop. So Coke pops on your tongue. It doesn't soda on your tongue. Two, the people here do not know how to make a peanut butter and banana sandwich. The right way is to slice a banana up and then press the slices one by one into the peanut butter, preferably in neat and orderly rows. But the kids in my new school mash the bananas, mix a spoonful of peanut butter into the mashed bananas, and then spread the whole gloopy mess on their bread. Why oh why would they do that? Three, and now instead of tag, they want to play Ooh, let's all be frozen statues while Abby runs around and around and around. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I do not want to call Pope Soda, Pop Soda. I do not want to eat gloopy banana mush. I do not want to be it. I'm pretty sure the way I play is the right way. I see my throat tightening. I'm right, I am. 
No, she states, I'm frozen. And you better get going or it'll just get harder. Tears were in the back of my eyes. I don't want things to get harder. I want things to be the way they used to be, normal. No thanks, I say in a careful voice that's meant not to, to let my tears out, but might sound a little squished or prissy or spoiled brat tea up possible. You're quitting? Penny asks her, her eyebrows fly up. Just because you didn't get your way? No, I'm just tired. I'm not even lying. I am tired. I'm tired of everything being different. Why can't things be like they used to be? I go to Miss Goldman, the teacher on playground duty. I ask her if I can go to the library. You mean the media room, hun? She asks. I shrink even smaller. They don't even call a library a library here. But the second I step into the media room, the world gets a little better. I take a deep breath. <sighs> Maybe in Smithwell, a room filled with books is called a media room. It smells just like the library in my old normal school. Musty, dusty, papery. The books on the shelves of the school library, media room, arg, are books I recognize. They're books I've gobbled up many times before, many, many times before. My shoulders sag with relief because guess what? No matter how many times you read them, stories always stay the same. I get my love of books from my Nana. She used to read to me all the time. She's a literature professor at a university in Chicago, the normal place where we used to live. I feel a pain in my gut when I think about my old house, my faraway friends, my Nana, peanut butter and banana sandwiches made the right way. And then I shake off those heavy feelings and run my fingers along the row of books. My finger stops. It rests on a collection called Fairy Tales, where good is good and bad is bad, and logical particle fifth grade girls never get stuck being it forever. My chest loosens. Perfect. Chapter 2. My Annoying Wake Up. That night, I'm dreaming about my old friends. We're playing tag the right way when someone calls my name. Abby, Abby, Abby. I half open one eye. It's Jonah, my seven-year-old brother. So I pull my bedspread over my head. Sure, I love the kid, but I'm a growing girl. I need my sleep. Jonah yanks down the covers, presses his mouth to my ear and says, Abby, 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 Abby. I groan. Jonah, I'm asleep. Wake up, wake up, wake up. Does he have to repeat everything a million times? There's a fine line between being persistent and being annoying. Go back to bed, I order. I've been told that I can be bossy, but come on, it's the middle of the night. Plus, it's my job as an older sister to boss Jonah around. I'm only performing, performing my sisterly duty. It's also my job to make sure he eats his vegetables. At dinner, I caught him hiding his broccoli in his sock, so I told on him. Then I felt guilty and gave him half my chocolate cookie. But the mirror is hissing, he says now. I squint at him. What? I don't even know what to do with that sentence. Jonah, mirrors don't hiss. They don't make any sounds at all, unless you break them. Uh-oh. I sit up like a jack-in-the-box. Did you break a mirror? That's bad luck. I don't think so. He does this weird twisty thing he sometimes does with his lips. Well, maybe. Jonah, which mirror? I swing my legs over the side of my bed. It better not be my pink hand mirror. The one I once caught him using to examine his toes. The big one downstairs. Are you kidding me? The creepy one in the basement? I realize I'm shrieking and I lower my voice so I won't wake my parents. Why were you in the basement so late at night? There's something odd about the mirror in our basement. It seems like it's watching me wherever I go, like the eyes in that painting, the Mona Lisa. But of course that makes no sense. Mirrors can't watch you. They're not alive. He shrugs. I was exploring. I glance at my alarm clock. It's 11.52. My wrist feels heavy and I realize I forgot to take my watch off before I went to sleep. I press the light. It says 11.52 too. Jonah shrugs again. Jonah is always exploring. It's amazing we're even, we're even related, really. We're so different. I like reading. He likes adventures. 
I like cuddling in my bed with a book. He'd rather be rock climbing. Seriously, mom takes him to rock climbing classes at the Y on Sundays. Patiently, I take a breath. I ask, did you see green? Because when Jonah was three, dad got him a clock that changes colors. All at night, it stays red, and then at 7 a.m., it turns green. Jonah is supposed to stay in bed until the clock turns green. But Jonah isn't great at following instructions or colors. I know how to tell the time, Jonah says all huffy. Then why did you wake me up? Because I saw purple too and I wanted to show you, he says. Then he waves at me to follow him. Come on, come on. Huh? He saw purple? I sigh. Crumbs. I get out of bed, step into my strict slippers and follow him. Wait, I say, spotting his bare feet. I steer him to his room, which is next to mine. You need shoes, mister. I don't want you cutting your foot on a piece of broken mirror glass. But there's no glass. He broke a mirror and there's no glass. I point to his closet. Shoes. It's my job to protect all of him, even his smelly feet. Jonah's room is bright because of the glow-in-the-dark star stuck to his ceiling and his red clock, not purple, red. Jonah grabs his sneakers from the floor of his closet and shoves them on. Are you happy now? Let's go, let's go. Shush, I order. Mom and Dad's door is closed, but their room is just down the hall. Mom will not be happy if we wake her up. She already got annoyed at me once today when I told her she was six minutes and 45 seconds late picking me up at school. I didn't mean to make her feel bad, but I have a super cool timer on my watch, and if I'm not gonna use it to tell her how late she is, then what am I gonna use it for? We slink down the first flight of stairs. They creak a lot. Finally, I reach to open the door of, to the basement. I freeze. I freeze as if, well, I've been tagged. Because the truth is, I'm possibly not the bravest girl in the world. And it's late, and we're going to the basement. I prefer reading about adventures, not having them. What's wrong? Joan asks, sliding in front of me and down the stairs. Come on, come on, come on. I take a big, deep breath, turn on the basement light, and close the door behind me. Chapter 3. Mirror, mirror, bolted to the wall. One step, creak. Two steps, two steps, creak. Three, creak. I stop on the very bottom stair and look across the basement at the huge and creepy mirror. It's still huge and creepy, but other than that, it looks perfectly fine. There's not a single crack in the mirror, I say. We're going back to bed now. I never said it was cracked, Jonah said. I said it was hissing. He approaches the mirror, getting so close his breath turns the glass foggy. It must have stopped when I left. I stay where I am, taking every last detail of the antique mirror the previous owners left behind. It's twice the size of me. The glass part is clear and smooth. The frame is made of stone and decorated with carvings of small fairies with wings and wands. I don't know why the old owners didn't take it with them. I've said, well, it's creepy. And attached to the wall with big, heavy Frankenstein bolts. In the reflection, I see my shoulder-length curly brown hair, my lime green pajamas, my striped slippers. Only there's something off about my reflection, so I turn away. I don't know what but exactly, but it's weird. It's not hissing, I say, checking out the rest of the basement. Black leather couch, desk, civil chair, lots and lots of bookshelves, all filled with my parents' old law books, which they never look at, but they don't want to throw away. Mom and Dad are both lawyers. Unlike me, neither of them wants to be a judge. For the record, I'm going to be a really great judge because I'm all about peace and order. I'll make sure justice is always served because it's not fair when bad people don't get in trouble or when bad things happen to good people. Like my parents making me move to Smithville. You have to knock, Jonah says, his words pull me back. What's that? On the mirror, he says, his eyebrows scrunching, scrunching together. You have to knock. I laugh. I'm not knocking on the mirror. Why would anyone knock on the mirror? They wouldn't if it was an accident. See, I was playing flying crocodile when... What's flying crocodile, I ask? An awesome new game I invented. I'm a pirate and I'm being chased by cro crocodiles. I'm so my crocodiles can fly and never mind, I say, regretting, I ask. How did this lead you to the mirror? Well, when I was being chased by one of the flying crocodiles, one of the imaginary flying crocodiles, when I was being chased by one of the imaginary flying crocodiles, I tripped and smacked into the not imaginary mirror. It sounded like a knock. 
I'll do it again. Ready? Ready for what? I'm ready to get back into my toasty bed, but I say to him, go, but to him, I say, go ahead. He lifts his fist and knocks. We wait. Nothing happened. Nothing's happening, I tell him, but then I hear a low hissing sound. My whole body tenses. I do not like hissing, especially hissing mirrors. Um, Jonah, see, now check this out. Look what happens when I knock twice. He knocks again, and a warm light radiates from the mirror, too. A warm purple light. See, Jonah says, purple, told you. My mouth goes dry. What is going on? Why is the mirror in our basement turning colors? Mirrors should not change colors. I do not like mirrors that change colors. This is when I went to get you. But I want to see what happens if I knock again. Three's a charm, right? Jonah, no! Too late. He's already knocking. Our reflection in the mirror starts to shake. I don't like shaking mirrors any more than I like purple hissing mirrors. What's it doing, I whisper. My image is rippling like the surface of, the, of a lake. My insides are rippling too. Have I mentioned I want to be a judge because I like peace and order and not rippling, hissing, purple turning mirrors? It's alive, Jonah squeals. The ripples on the mirror spin in a circle like a whirlpool. We should go, I say, as a tingle, has tingle scraped down my spine, like now. I try to pull Jonah away, but I can't. Our images are turning round and around and around in the mirror, like clothes in the dryer, and we're being dragged towards the mirror. Jonah's right foot slides forward. His sneaker squeaks against the concrete floor. It wants my foot, Jonah cries. Well, it can't have it. I grab him tight. You can't have it, you, you mirror thing. I crane my neck toward the basement stairs. Mom! Dad! I yell, but there are two floors up, and I've closed the basement door. Why did I close the basement door? I snuck into a basement in the middle of the night and closed the door. What is wrong with me? I need backup. Help! With my free hand, I reach out and grasp the leg of the desk. My fingers burn, but I'll absolutely not let go of my brother or the desk leg. Whoosh! Suddenly, the whole world turns sideways. Jonah and I are horizontal. We wave in the air like human flags, which makes no sense. I don't like things that make no sense. Cool, Jonah hollers. Is he smiling? He is. He's smiling. How could he be having fun at a time like this? My brother's shoe disappears, disappears right off his foot and goes into the air. No, impossible. There's a really loud buzzing and my brother's other shoe gets swallowed by the mirror too. Slurp. My heart is racing, and I'm hot and cold at the same time, because that could have not just happened. None of this can be happening. And why weren't Jonah's shoes tied? Do I have to do everything myself? My slippers are suddenly sucked off my feet. So, not my fault. You can't tie slippers. A book flies off the bookshelf and into the mirror, and another. All my parents' law books go swoop right off the bookshelf and into the mirror, the pages flapping like the wings of the overexcited birds. The civil chair scoots across the floor, slurp. My brother's hands are slipping. Abby, he says, and for the first time tonight, my brother, who isn't afraid of anything, sounds square, sounds squ scared. Hold on, I try to tighten my grip on his hand, but our palms are clammy. Pain shoots right from my fingers to my shoulders. I ignore it. I need to hold on, I have to hold on. Abby, no, I say, holding on even tighter. He flutters in the air, his eyes are wide and glowing purple. Jonah, I scream. No, no, no. I will not let the crazy mare slurp up my brother. I'm in charge here. I'll keep my brother safe. I let go of the leg of the desk and grab his, him with both hands. With a satisfied grumble, the mare sucks us both inside. Chapter 4. Too Many Trees. Thump. I land face down on the dirt. Dirt and leaves and grass. There's a twig in my mouth. Blah, blah. I pick it out and wipe my hand on my pajamas bottom. I think I just broke my head, Jonah mumbles. Seriously, I ask. No, Jonah says, rubbing the back of his neck. I'm okay. Good. I'm glad he's okay. Now I don't have to feel bad when I yell at him. What were you thinking? What do you mean? He asks innocently. 
I leap to my feet and tick off the answers on my fingers. Exhibit A, you drag us to the basement. Exhibit B, you knock on the creepy mirror. And exhibit C, D, and E, you then proceed to knock two more times on the creepy mirror. And when it tries to suck us in, you said, cool. Cause it was, he exclaims. Come on, Abby, that was so awesome. That was the most awesomest thing to ever happen to us. I shake my head. I'm not sure what even happened. Where are we? I sniff. It smells like nature. I push myself up onto my elbows and look around. I see large trees, more large trees, even more large trees. Um, why are there th three thousand? Why are there thousands of large trees in my basement? Wait, my basement does not have trees. I turn to Jonah. We're not in the basement. I know. Jonah says, nodding. Sweet. So where are we? Somewhere awesome. The backyard, I say, we have to be in the backyard, right? Except we have a tiny backyard, and our backyard has only two trees. Two scrawny trees, not thousands of large trees. No way, we're not in the backyard, Jonah says, shaking his head. Maybe it looks different at night? Nope, I think we're in a forest. Jonah, we can't be in a forest, that's impossible. Well, maybe impossible things are possible. He is impossible, I rub my eyes. This makes no sense. Wait, what if we're dreaming? Both of us, he asks, raising one eyebrow. Fine me, what if I'm dreaming? He pinches me. Ow! Not dreaming, he proclaims. He bounces on his toes. You're 100% awake and so am I. We are in a forest. Hey, I'm hungry. Do you have any Cheetos? Cheetos, I screech. We're so, we've somehow been transported from our basement to a forest in the middle of the night, and you're thinking about Cheetos. He scratches his belly. The mirror was hungry, so it ate us. Now I'm hungry, and I would really like some flaming hot Cheetos and maybe some ketchup. That is disgusting, I say. Jonah dips everything in ketchup, even French toast. And it's not the middle of the night, he continues. Look, I tilt my head. Blue sky peaks through the tops of the trees. Before it was night, now it's day. I don't understand what's going on. I stomp my foot like a two-year-old. Ouch. A twig scratches my heel because, oh, that's right. Before the mirror ate me, the mirror ate my slippers, but here I am, so where are my fuzzy striped slippers? First I'll find my slippers, then I'll figure out how to get back to our basement. That is my plan. Plans make me happy. Step one, find footwear. I crane my neck and check out the seam. In addition to me and my brother, our basement chair is lying on its side a few feet from us. Some of the books from the bookshelf are also in the grass and they're my slippers. Yay, I cheer. I run toward them and slip them on. Ah, fuzzy striped slippers can make a person feel much better. I turn to Jonah. Did you find your sneakers? Yep, he says, pointing at them. We'll put them on and tie them this time. I just wait. Are they tied? I know he knows how to tie them because I taught him. And I taught him the right way, not the baby way with two bows. He groans and laces them extra tight. Good. We've completed step one. Now for step two. Get back to her basement. Hmm, that one's tougher, but nothing I can't handle. I suppose it would help if I could figure out where we are. We can't be very far from home since the whole trip only took like a minute. There must have been a tornado or maybe even an earthquake. Yes, an earthquake. An earthquake that tossed us a few blocks from our house. Yes, we must have hit our heads and fallen asleep. And that's why it's already daytime. Now I just have to find our way home. Time to focus. Growl. What was that? Nothing. I must have imagined it. Crack. Did you hear that? Jonah whispers. Um, no. Growl. My heart thumps. Any chance it's your stomach grumbling because you're hungry? He scoots closer. Maybe it's an animal's stomach because the animal's hungry. Growl. Crack. Hungry for humans, Jonah says, sounding a bit too excited for my liking. Crack. Growl. Arg. How am I supposed to focus on step two of my plan with scary animal stomach noises all around me? I think we should go, I tell him. Go where? Growl, crack, growl, crack, growl, crack, crack. Somewhere that isn't here. I grab his hand and we run. Chapter five, hide and seek. I never knew I could move so fast. 
if I was back at school playing tag, the right or the wrong tag, no one would ever catch me. That's the good news about my mad dash with Jonah. The bad news is that I have no idea which way's home or where in Smithville we are. I also don't know what's chasing us, but guess what? Our fast running feet may have outrun it because I no longer hear anything behind us. Then again, that may be because my loud huffing and puffing is drowning out all the other sounds. A sharp pain stabs my side and I stop. Need water, Jonah pants. Need food. Forget Cheetos, I'll eat anything, but no broccoli, please. I lean over and try to catch my breath. I don't know about you, but I've yet to spot a restaurant around here. Just trees, trees, and more trees. Look, Jonah says, dropping his voice. He points at something up ahead. I look, and my heart leaps when I see that it, it's a person. A female adult person. Oh, yay, I call, charging toward her. Hi there. She keeps going, slipping between the trees. Did she not hear? Excuse me, I cry. Wait, hold up. Finally, she turns around. She's old, like grandparent old, but without the hot pink lipstick my Nana wears, and she's wearing a black coat and holding a basket. I wave and smile. She glares and continues walking. How rude. Grown-ups aren't supposed to be rude. My Nana would never be rude. Now, what am I supposed to do? Excuse us, Jonah yells. Excuse us, excuse us, excuse us, excuse us, excuse us, excuse us. The lady stops in her track and turns around again. What? She barks. Yay, Jonah. I guess being persistent can pay off. Do you know where we are? Jonah asks. We're kind of lost, I add. We were in our basement, but then we knocked on our mirror, or rather my silly brother knocked on the mirror, and maybe it's not best not to get into the details. Well, anyway, can you help us, please? I give her my my most charming smile. I elbow Jonah to indicate that he should do the same. She scowls and goes back to walking. My Nana would never ignore two lost kids in a forest, even if they weren't us. She would walk them home, tell them to wear a hat, and bring them chicken soup. What should we do, I asked Jonah. Follow her. I don't think we should, I say. She's mean. I don't think she really wants us to either. Do you have a better idea, he asks. I chew on my bottom lip. Jonah takes that to mean, okay then, follow the mean lady it is. And off he goes. I hesitate, then hurry to catch up. Quietly, I whisper, grabbing his arm to slow him down and stop him from stomping on every branch and twig. Mean lady goes around a tree. We go around the same tree. Then hide. She goes straight. We go straight. She goes right. We go right. We're sneaky and follow her wherever she goes. Then even more sneakily, we hide and follow and hide and follow and hide. I hope she's not lost too, Jonah whispers at his death behind a tree. Ten minutes later, she reaches a path. Yay, only I still don't know where we are. Why does Smithville have forests with paths in the middle of nowhere? This place is so weird. First soda instead of pop and now weird forests. We follow the old lady for another five minutes until we arrive at a house. It's a small house. It's painted white with flowers planted in the front garden and it's cute and tidy and welcoming. My chest feels lighter because mean lady does know where she's going. She's going here. And it's better to follow a mean lady who knows where she's going than no one at all, right? I pull Jonah down behind a tree as mean lady walks up the charming stone footpath. She knocks on the door once, twice. No one answers. She knocks again. And finally the curtain behind one of the window twitches. Chapter six, an apple a day. Someone's home, Jonah whispers. Why aren't they answering? If a meanie like that was knocking on your door, would you? I ask him. He'd better not. I know you're there, you silly thing, the lady said in a teasing way. She's acting a lot friendlier to the silly thing in the house than she acted towards us. The curtains move and the window opens. It's just, well, you see, I'm not allowed to answer the door, the person inside replies. Someone is home. It's definitely a girl. She doesn't sound like a kid, but she doesn't sound like a grown-up either. A teenager, maybe? The old lady pulls a shiny red apple out of her basket. It glistens in the sun. Hungry, Jonah whispers. He pretends to be a zombie and makes his eyes glaze over. Hungry. I pinch him. Shit. 
I have apples to sell, the lady sing songs. No, thank you, the girl says from behind the curtain window. Window curtain, I'm not supposed to buy anything. I'll give you one as a gift, the lady offers, then clears her throat. <clears throat> I'll sell the rest later. No, really, that's okay, the girl says, but thank you. If I lean forward, I can see a corner of her face. Her hair is super dark and her skin is super pale. I'm set not in a zombie way, more like in a china doll way. And her lips are really red, really, really red, like blood red, but again, not in a bad blood red way. She's beautiful, actually. Also, she looks familiar, like I've seen her before. Has she babysat for us, maybe? But so yummy, the lady coaxes, extending the apple so juicy so fresh what's wrong are you concerned it might be jonah scrambles out into the open too quickly for me to catch him i'll take it i'll take the yummy juicy apple oh brother jonah i whisper yeah get back here he skids to a stop at the front door hi he says smiling at the old lady he holds out his open hand can i have one please the old lady snaps it's not for you bye bye now but I said, please, he whines, and I'm starving. I groan, then emerge from our hiding spot. You heard the lady, it's bye-bye time. I grip her shoulder and lower my voice. Plus, you shouldn't eat food from a stranger, and you know it. Then why can the girl inside eat it, my brother asks. Hmm, a red apple, a girl inside with dark hair and white skin. Something odd is happening in my head. It's a kind of brain squiggling, as if I should be figuring something out. She can't either, I said distracted. Anyway, she's not going to, didn't you hear her? To the girl, I say, I call, good job on staying safe. I give her a thumbs up, which the old lady squats away. Scoot, the now extremely grumpy old lady says to me, and Jonah, time for you to go now. She tries to smile at us, but it looks fake and a little scary. Then she turns back to the girl. Time for you to eat the apple, dear one. Why is she being so unfair? Joan asks me. He reaches out, tilts the basket toward him, and peeks inside. If she's got a whole basket of apples, then why can't she... He, he breaks off. Hey, wait a sec. The basket's empty, you big liar. The old lady wrenches the basket from him and yells, Go away! But you said apples, Joan insisted. You said you were selling apples. So how come you only have the one you're holding? I already sold the rest, the lady said. All right, are you satisfied? My spine is seriously tingling. Something weird is going on. I turn to the girl in the window. Do people often come to your door selling food? That never happens at our house, except for the Squanchin's grocery delivery guy. And he drives a big truck and it says Squanchin right there on the side. And he wears a uniform. Girl Scouts too, Jonah says contributing. They come around and sell cookies. True, and they wear uniforms too, don't they? I turn to the old lady. So what's the deal? If you're selling apples, why do you only have one piece of fruit? I look at her black cloak. And is that supposed to be an apple seller uniform? Because I've got to be honest, it's not like sending the right vibe. Take the apple, the old lady orders a girl. It seems like she's decided the best way to deal with me and Jonah is to pretend we don't exist. Enjoy it, it's free. I don't think so, the girl replies, her voice wobbling. Take it! Beads of sweat glisten onto the old lady's forehead. Makeup starts to smear down her face. Lots of makeup. Is your skin melting? Joan asks. The girl gasps. It's you, she cries, pointing to old lady. You try to treat me by wearing a disguise. Her voice catches as if she's frightened or about to cry or both. But, but, but it didn't work, so please just go away. She slams the window and draws the curtains closed. The lady stomps her feet. With her melting makeup, she no longer looks old, just strange. The features of her face are all blurry, like if you spilled water on a painting. She mutters and says a bunch of words my Nana would never use. She waves the apple at my brother. You want my apple so badly? You can have it. Go ahead, eat it. Jonah grows pale. Never mind, I'm not really hungry anymore. The melting old lady takes off her black cloak, exposing a tight black gown, and whips a cloak at Jonah. Hey, I protest. She draws herself tall, and something glints near her col collarbone. It looks like a necklace with something hanging from it. I think it's a key. I can't get a good enough look to be sure. Then she lifts her fist to the sky. 
one hand clenching the apple, the other clenching air, and roars lines down. She has really lost him. She glor, gl glor, she glores at, gla glo <laughs> she glores at my brother. She stilts her eyes. She takes two steps toward him and mutters, you will pay for this. You ruined my whole plan. How dare she? I wrap my arms around Jonah and yell, don't you threaten my brother. We're not scared of you. What plan is she talking about anyway? Just because I have a plan, she has to have a plan too. Ed said, I don't have a plan. Not exactly. The old lady laughs a terrifying high-pitched laugh. The kind that makes mirrors not just shake, but shatter. The kind that would scare anyone. She throws her basket on the ground and stumps back into the forest. I feel my brother shake, shivering. I think I want to go home now, he whispers. Me too, and we will, I say with fake confidence. If Jonah, who loves adventures, is squared, then the world has officially turned upside down. And if the world has turned upside down, then that leaves me to be the brave one, doesn't it? Which is a very frightening thought. Think, Abby, the plan. What's the next step in the plan? We, I know, use the girl's phone. Yes, call home. Get mom and dad to come get us. If they, don't, if they can't get here but they're by car, they can always try the mirror. I knock on the door once, twice, three times. I'm not giving up. Please go away, the girl says wearily. I told you I'm not allowed to let anyone in. Yes, but we aren't melty or scary, I beg. My brother and I, just we just need to use your phone. My what? Your phone. I don't know what you're talking about. Jonah pokes at me. Ask her, ask if she has a snack. I promise we're not bad guys, I say. We're just normal kids, and my brother is really hungry. Haven't you ever been lost before? There's silence. I hold my breath, then miraculously the door creaks open, and we see the girl for real. She looks about the same age as my cousin, who's 16. She's more beautiful than I first thought, despite the frown creasing her pale skin. I'm going to get in trouble for this, she says. She pushes her red lips together and swings the door wider. But all right, you can come in. Chapter 7. Hello, Snow. I'm Abby, and this is my brother Jonah, I say as we follow her into the house. Epsa isn't really a house. It's more of a, well, cottage. But that sounds like a word my Nana would use. Everything is small, really small. Small table, small chairs, small lamp, and everything's tidy. Couch cushions are plumped and upright. Tables perfectly set, fork plate, knife, fork plate, knife, times eight. She must have a big family, well, a small big family. Well, where is everybody? It's uh, lovely to meet you, the girl flatters. She clutches the skirt of her dress, and I get the sense she's not used to having visitors. I'm Snow. Snow? What kind of name is Snow? What an interesting name, I say, or I think I say. Maybe I don't. My eyelids only weigh a ton. I can barely hold them open. I yawn. My brother pinches my arm. Ouch, I'm not falling asleep, I say, although I kind of am. It's late, and we've walked for miles, and it's warm in here. He waggles his eyebrows. What, I say. Her name is Snow, he says, and waggles his eyebrows again. Yes, Jonah, I say, giving him a look. I heard Snow, he repeats, giving me a look right back. Whoa, my head feels cloudy, but that's not excuse for 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 but that's no excuse for forgetting my manners. Right, sorry. Nice to meet you too, Snow. Do you think we can use your phone? You keep saying that, but I don't know what you mean, Snow said. I sigh. Who doesn't know what a phone is? But don't say that. That would be me mega rude. Maybe she's homeschooled or one of those kids who's never allowed to watch TV or use a cell phone. Jonah pinches me again. Abby, he whispered, Snow is, stop it, I mutter and yawn again. Why is he being so embarrassing? I can't take him anywhere, but shush, no talking, zip it. When mom and dad tells him to zip it, he has to be quiet and silently count to 100. Would you like to sit down? Snow asks, his, motioning to the couch. Yes, thank you, I say. My whole body aches. My feet are on fire. Walking in slippers was not my best move. If I'd known I'd been hiking through the forest when Jonah woke me up, I would have worn sneakers and kept them tied. I collapse onto the couch, so tired. I'm saying it's hard to get comfy. These cushions are so small. Who fits on a couch like this? And Jonah squeezes in beside me and bounces. Do you have to use the bathroom? I ask him, struggling to keep my eyes open. He shakes his head back and forth. Then he giggles. He giggles. What is wrong with him? Does he ever get tired? Can I get you anything? Snow asks. 
Do you have any Cheetos? Joan asks. Snow looks at us blankly. I don't know what those are either. Her parents must be health nuts too. Do you two live around here? She asks. At last we're getting somewhere. Yes, I say, I mean, no. I mean, can you just tell us how to get to Sharonta, Sharonton Street from here? Realizing how lame I must sound, I add, um, that's where we live. We just moved. I've never heard of Sheraton Street, she says. So you're really two lost kids. You're really not wearing disguises. I laugh uneasily. Do people come over here wearing disguises? Only my stepmother, Jonah, bounces again. Jonah, stop, I say and turn back to Snow. Why would your stepmom put on a disguise so I won't recognize her? I rub my forehead because what she says makes no sense and makes total sense at the same time. It's like I'm being given puzzle pieces one by one one and then another and then another and if i wasn't so tired i could probably put all the pieces together and make some sort of picture i'm glad you showed up snow continues otherwise i probably wouldn't have realized it was my stepmother at the door and i would have taken an apple who knows what would have happened then i do jonah blurts up you would have eaten the apple and it would have been poison that's what he zipped it up for about a minute not bad for jonah wait what did he just say the apple would have been poisoned? Yeah, Jonah says. Snow stepmom was trying to kill her with the poisoned apple. So that's why she was wearing a disguise, so Snow would open the door. How could you not remember this story? Nana used to read it to us, to you, to us all the time. Stepmom, apple, disguise, poison. I'm suddenly wide awake. Oh my goodness. Finally, Jonah says and throws his hands in the air. No, yes, impossible. You're Snow White, I say. You can't be. She blinks her round blue eyes. How do you know my last name? Okay, this book will now be to be continued tomorrow.